whole story. And um, there are wonderful parents who survived the Holocaust and came to Israel. They married in the camp. It is an amazing story. And uh, first this nice little girl came out. <laughs> and then she was born, I think, in Israel. Yeah? So I, I, I want you to bless them by buying their book. You know their book? It says, it's written by their father. Dear God, have you ever gone hungry? And it tells the story. And you have seen the story now. But it's such a nice book to give to people who still don't understand from what deep valley the Jews came back to this land. My son, he said, Papa, when you go through the Yad Vashem and you come out, after all you've seen, you look and you see the New Jerusalem. There were six million dead. And when you look, there are six million live Jews, about the same number, that have the greatest future. I remember, and then I give it to them, Mr. Bacon speaking to 5,000 Holocaust survivors at the Western Wall. And he asked this question, it was an amazing meeting. I think it was 1981. He says, my people, where was our God when six million of us died? And then he gave the answer. If it was not for the mercies of the Lord God, we would have all been like Sodom and Gomorrah. And then he said this, let us not forget that the generation of Jews who saw the darkest page of history, the Holocaust, also saw the brightest, the return to Zion and the resurrection of Israel. I never forget. Those who saw the deepest valley also see the hills of Judea. <laughs> Now you tell the story. <laughs> we are so excited to be with you today. This is, you know, first shalom. And we love you so much, so much. Van Hoven is unbelievable. Yes. We are family. And Rosemarie, she's our sister. <laughs> We all together, one family, actually, all. We are, you know what? I will begin with that. Our father and our mother, they suffer so much. And you know, like 30 years ago, our father said to us, listen, all the world will come to Israel to visit, I said. Who want to come to Israel, to Jewish country? Who want to come? You will see. Like today, I remember, and not enough that he said that, he paint here, Jerusalem, here we come, that all the world is coming to Israel. And our parents believed in miracles. They said every minute that we are alive, this is a miracle. Every day, our mother opened the window. Oh, what a beautiful day. I didn't see this leaf yet. I didn't see this bird yet. And our father was the same. Our father was artist. He was graphic artist, a painter photographer. He was the first animator in Israel. He did animation films. Uh, writer. But before everything, he was the best husband, the best father that can be. Unbelievable. He saved hundreds of Jews in the Holocaust. He was forging documents for them. And after that, people came to him and said, why you don't make for yourself and you will run away? He said, 
who will save the others. And he stood in the Holocaust up to, he stayed there up to the last day. And my mom, we're going to publish her book, we're going to publish this, you know, for us is hard to make it. But she wrote memoir and she wrote in the name of God. This is the name of the book. And she writes there how she saved Jewish people <coughs> with their names. Our father, in his book, Dear God, Have You Ever Gone Hungry? Even didn't write in one word that he saved hundreds of Jews. He was for documents. Nothing. He was so modest. Every book has insight. This is Stadt Krakow. The German gave it to the Jewish people. This was the passport, you see. Here is written in German, Arbeitswag. It means, this is by our grandma, our father, mother. One thing left from her. And Arbeitswag, it means to be a slave. She was a slave. All our family, they were slaves. Our father, our mother. You know what? Big, big miracle. All the family was murdered in our father's side and in our mother's side. They are <laughs> big miracle. Only one brother of my father uh, alive, was alive. And uh, we celebrate all the years, all the holidays alone. We didn't have family. Now you are our family. Amen. 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 Yeah. And you know what? This book, Dear God, Have You Ever Gone Hungry? From the first letter up to the last letter, the miracles that happened to Joseph and Rebecca Baum. Our father wanted to call this book like that. But you won't believe. This book is with sense of humor. He wrote it with sense of humor in a time like that. And from this terrible, most terrible in the history, he wanted that all the world will be happy. And he told jokes. Tzlila will tell you about it. <laughs> Did you see the movie Schindler List? Yes. So the wedding there is our parents' wedding. Oh. Rebecca and Joseph Bau, the original couple. And maybe we will laugh now in this place for our parents. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone yeah. that we love. <laughs> because you know, our father said that the most beautiful opera is the laughter. Yeah. He wanted only that people will laugh and he also, he was creating every day new joke. And he told all the people, we have a museum in Tel Aviv, we invite you too. He builds everything. And about all that, Sila will tell you, and after we will show you his paintings, also very funny, that you only see the painting, you begin to laugh. <laughs> so, so our parents met inside the concentration camp. Our father got dressed as a woman, smuggled himself into the women's camp. <laughs> That's how they got married secretly. <laughs> Much more special than you see in the movie. <laughs> and I'll tell you about it. Our father started studying art in the University of Plastic Arts in Krakow in Poland. And, uh, and by the way, right now there is a very big exhibition of our father's uh, uh, paintings in uh, Oskar Schindler's museum in Krakow. If someone is going there, so you might see it, it's for another two weeks. It uh, started in May. So our father started studying art, and uh, one year he managed to study before the war broke out. By the end of the year, <coughs> the professor who was teaching them calligraphy, how to write letters, came and said, you know, I have to teach you something not important. If someone doesn't want, doesn't have to. Our father said the pupils, the students heard they don't have to. They got up and left. And our father said, I don't know why I fell in love with the letters. Those were Gothic letters. Gothic yeah. letters were ancient German letters. Yeah. And he said, I studied them day and night. And then the summer vacation came. In September, the war broke out. He didn't go back to school. 
And when they put him in the ghetto, him and his family, he was smart enough, we don't even know how he thought about it, he took with him the drafting table, all the pens and pencils, and the special case that his parents bought him. And there, in that case, he made a double bottom, and he hid pictures from his parents. Luckily, because today we have pictures from the family, they all were murdered. And he writes a sign. Joseph Bau, graphic artist, he wrote it in Gothic letters and he puts it in the window. And his mother asked him, why are you writing such a sign? I don't know, maybe it will help. And really the Nazis were looking for someone who knew to write those letters and he was the only one. <laughs> so we can say that the art saved him because they took him to work as a draftsman, as a, a graphic artist. But secretly, mm. he was forging documents and he saved hundreds of people. Hallelujah. Yeah. A few months ago, we were talking mm. to one of our father's friends and he said to us, from where do you think the underground in the ghetto, there was an underground in the ghetto, had money to buy weapons. We don't know. Your father was forging documents, they sold it for a lot of money, and they had money. But no one knew it's Joseph Bawudi, because they kept him secret. From the ghetto, they transferred him and his, uh, the other people to Plaschau concentration camp. And also there, they used him as a draftsman, graphic artist. And one day, while he was drawing the map of the camp, now maybe someone <coughs> visited the Pla Krakow here? Mm. No? If, yeah? Did you go to Plasha? <coughs> this concentration camp is, was erased by the Nazis. If you come there, it looks like a park. Trees, bushes, no one even knows there was a camp. The only thing that proves there was a camp is the map, is the map that our father drew inside the concentration camp. And thanks to this map, people know today what was there, and this is the map. And he wrote the story in the book as a tourist guide, <coughs> taking the reader inside the camp. <laughs> and he called it Root of Tour. <laughs> and while he is drawing the map, the commandant of the camp, Amon Get, if you remember from the movie, a horrible yes. murderer, came to him and says, I want you to make a blueprint out of this map. Now, a blueprint, today, how do you make a blueprint? You put in a machine, you get the print, right? In those days, how did you have to do it? You had to put the drawing on a wooden frame. Underneath, you put a special paper that was sensitive to sun rays. You put outside the light made the copy, and then you had to develop it in the chemical. So when he comes to our father and he tells him, now in Polish and in Hebrew, you don't call it a blueprint. You call it sun print. So he comes to our father and said, I want you to make a sun print out of the drawing. So our father takes a look and says, look, there is no sun today. Today, I cannot do it. What do I care about the sun? I want the copy. And I want it now. And he added, so our, my, our father will understand what he says. He said to him, you have to know, it's or a copy or a bullet in the head. So our father wrote in the book. He was a big specialist in murdering, but not in engineering. And he had to do it. So he put the drawing on the frame, underneath he put the special paper, he went outside and waited for the sun. But the sun didn't come out. He didn't know what to do. He aimed it at the sky, praying for the sun to come out. Like today, look at the sun. But the sun didn't come out. Suddenly, a young woman, I should add a beautiful woman, <laughs> walked by and sees him holding it like this, she says, excuse me, sir, what are you doing? Later, she told him that she thought he was signaling to American airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to her, do you know, I am waiting for the sun, but the sun doesn't want to come to me. 
you know what? He said to her, maybe you could substitute the sun for me and aim the frame at her like that. So she blushed, laughed, and ran away. So he said, he's going to kill me because the copy didn't come out. And he went to the office. He said, I'll try. What will happen will happen. He takes down the paper, puts it in the chemical, and a miracle, the copy came out. <laughs> So he said, ah, so she was my son. <laughs> and he wanted to thank her. So he found some flowers, bushes, grass, I don't know what. He made a bouquet. He was very creative and very romantic. And he saw where she ran to, and he goes to her with the flowers. And engineer was sitting there. He sees our father walking with flowers. He said, are you crazy? The commandant, Amon Get, is sitting here. If he sees you with the flowers, he's going to kill you on the spot. Grab the flowers from his hand and throw it to the garbage. So our father left. A few days later, while he was in line to get his daily soup, all of a sudden, he saw his son. <laughs> and she came to him and said, Do you know, after the commandant, Amon Ged, left the building, the engineer took out the flowers from the garbage, gave them to me, and said, Do you know, Yuzek Bao brought it to you as a thank you. And you know, I know him. I think you should meet him. <laughs> so, when she told it to my dad, they were so happy. They wanted to hug or kiss, but they knew that even if they touch each other, the Nazis will kill them on the spot. So they decided to meet in a secretive place. And there they used to meet. And our father writes in the book, while we were courting, I wanted to bring her something. But what could I bring? Nothing. For example, I knew that she loved that her shoes were shiny, but we didn't have any shoe polish. So I got an idea. When I came to her, I spat on her shoe, and with the sleeve, I went like this, and her shoes were shiny, and she was happy. <laughs> Till one day he said to her, do you know what? Let's get married. Married? Inside a concentration camp? Are you nuts? <laughs> Tell me, do we have what to lose? Who promises us that tomorrow we will be alive? You are right. And they decided to get married. So what did our father do? He didn't eat his daily bread that they got every day for a few days. And what did they get? A tiny piece of bread. And he kept it a few days. And for that, he bought from someone a spoon. And then again, he didn't eat his daily bread for a few days and gave the spoon to a jeweler. And he made her with two rings. Those rings he gave his mom that was together with his uh, bride in the women's camp. And on the day they decided they would get married, on that day they took the women outside to work our hard labor outside the camp. And they returned late at night, and they had, when they had to enter the women's camp, they had to cross through the men's camp. When they crossed the men's camp, the Nazis turned off all the lights, that there won't be any contact between the women and the men. But the women who returned alive, because you know they killed them all the time, wanted to let the relatives know I am alive, because they didn't know who is alive. Now, how did they do it? They whistled. Each family had a whistle. And then the men wanted to let the woman know I am also alive. So he whistled back. This was like the whistle of life. So our mom whistled. And our father answered. 
<laughs> you know, Adassa's phone is whistling. This, <laughs> we managed to do it so that phone whistles. Oh. Hallelujah! <laughs> and uh, Mm -hmm. Our mom whistled, and our father answered, and she whistled, and he, till they found each other in the darkness. <coughs> and you know, our parents always said, even our grandchildren today are whistling our whistle. <laughs> Who even in the camp thought that we are going to have grandchildren? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And then they whistled to each other in the darkness till they found each other in his pocket, he kept a white kerchief, like the women, put on his head, stood between his mom and his bride, and like this, quietly, they smuggled him into the women's camp. They came to his mom's barrack, he put the ring on our mom, said like in a Jewish wedding, Ariat Mekudeshet li zo. Our grandma was the one who did the wedding, and that's it. In the movie, they show chupa. Our father said in the whole camp, you couldn't find even one piece of shit or something, and they made a chupa. But Hollywood is Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> and then he told our mom, now we should celebrate our wedding night. What he's thinking about in the camp. <laughs> and they go to her barrack, barrack number 13. Now you know that the people were sleeping there on benches, right? Bank benches along the walls. And our, our mom was on the third bench. And on each bench there were, maybe it was designed for two people, but there were five or eight women sleeping. They were very, like sardines they were sleeping. My mom, our mom was on the third level. Now when her bench mates saw the young couple walking in, they went down and they let them have the bench. <laughs> but the lights weren't turned off. Someone asked the head of the barrack, why aren't you turning off the lights? She said, because the Germans are on the way to see if any man smuggled himself. Mm -hmm. Our mom heard it, she got so scared, she looked for a piece of rug, put on top of our father, lay on top of him, her friends immediately jumped back. They all lay on top of him. <coughs> and he wrote in the book, they were pretending to be sleeping, but they couldn't fall asleep because the cushion was shaking so bad <laughs> under him. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Nazis came. They found two men, dragged them outside, and killed them in a horrible way. And all of a sudden, our father heard the trumpet in the men's camp calling them to be counted because they understood that some people, are, men are missing. He, t he says to our mom, listen, if I won't be there immediately, if I won't return, they are going to kill all my friends in the barrack. And me, in the morning, I have to go back. He put the kerchief on his head, jumped from the bench, ran to the gate. The gate was closed. There was no way he could get out. He said, I stood there and I didn't know what to do. If I jump on the fence, it was electrocuted. I would have died. He heard the pssss. If I stay here, they're going to kill me. So I'm dead anyway. So he said to himself, why should I let the Nazis have the fun of killing me in the morning? No. I will kill myself. He said every morning when they got up, they looked at the electrocuted barbed wire and they saw people who lost hope and they committed suicide. And he said, I'm going to jump on the fence and I will die on the fence. But this is going to be such a horrible death because in the morning when everyone will get up, they'll say, look at music. Where did he spend his last night? With the women. <laughs> and he jumped on the fence, and all his life he said, I don't know what a miracle, nothing happened to me. <laughs> and I could hear the bzzz of the electricity. 
He climbed up three meters, jumped to the other side, just his pants store, ran towards the counting ground, and as he came there, they blew the trumpet, canceling the count. <laughs> and all his life, he said, this was our wedding night. <laughs> Without food, rabbi, music. <laughs> After the war, they found each other in a miraculous way. They returned to Krakow because he wanted to finish his studies. They got married again with a rabbi, with food, music, and guests. And all their lives, they celebrated two anniversaries. <laughs> and look, this is the picture. This is the wedding picture in 46. Now they wanted to have a picture also from first wedding. But there weren't any cameras. So what did our father do? In, on this picture, he painted stripes. And now you see both pictures. <laughs> Now, you know, when we went the first time to Plaszow concentration camp, I told you today, so it's not, nothing is left, nothing, you have to understand, everything was destroyed. And there is one architect who is also a historian, and he is uh, searching. Every year after the snow melts, he comes to look for more things. He took us to show us the place. And he, according to the map and to our father's book, he explained to us what exactly what happened there. He says, and here we are going, here was the fence, here your father jumped on the fence, here was the women's camp. And then he says, do you see this? There is a, a concrete wall about this height, just long like this, let's see, maybe one meter. Uh, this is the only thing left from the camp. And this is the foundation of one barrack that was here. And Adasa asked him, do you by any chance know what barrack? He said, yeah, according to your father's book, this is barrack number 13. And this was our mom's barrack. <coughs> and there they were together. So can you imagine what Adasa and I felt being there, standing on this foundation? The only thing left from the whole camp, it's just something that is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And now when we were there, he told us, every time we come, he tells us new things because he's uh, researching it. He said that when they, there was, they were in the camp, the Nazis heard that there is a, a Polish wedding in the city, not Jews. And they went, the Nazis, they took the bride, the groom, the whole, the, everyone, the whole wedding, they brought them to the camp and killed them in front, so all the Jews will see, and they told them, you have to know, you see, they are Polish people, but they got married, and uh, we want you to know, we are killing them, so don't even think about love or wedding. And a few days later, our parents get married inside the camp. <laughs> so he told us that not only that they loved each other so much, but they wanted to be like a symbol to the other people. You see, we are getting married, it's going to continue, we won't die. They gave them hope. And <clears throat> many friends of our parents told us, he kept us alive by telling us jokes every day but by making us laugh. And, and he, even inside the camp, you know, he made uh, cards, playing cards. And when he saw someone wanted to jump on the fence, he said, come, come for a minute. I want to tell you a joke. Ah, leave me alone. He said, no, no, come. And he told him such a dirty joke that he really laughed. And then he said, do you know to play, do you want to play cards? Cards, who is here card? Come, come. He took out the cards and he made them humoristic cards. 
and he was playing, and the man was laughing, and he forgot that he wanted to commit suicide. <laughs> Those cards are in Yad Vashem. Our father gave them. And uh, so they go back to uh, Krakow, and uh, our father wants to study. He goes back to study. Our mom gets pregnant. The apartment where they lived, the landlord comes to us and says, you are pregnant? Yes. A Jewish baby won't be born in my house and kicked them out. And they have no place to live. Now in Krakow there is a uh, castle, a palace, sorry, a palace, mm. that the Nazis didn't destroy. And the king, at the time of the king, he had some houses where he put his guests so our parents got an apartment in the palace. <laughs> and Adassa was born in the palace. Wow. <laughs> and then when our parents in 1950 immigrated to Israel, and Adassa always wanted to have a sister or a brother. All her friends are sisters and brothers. And just she was the only child. And all the time she was begging, please, mom, dad, I want a sister, I want a brother. And our mom said, you know, I can't because I'm very sick. I didn't tell you, but in the camp and the ghetto, our mom saved so many people. And she was punished so badly for that. And she became very sick. And she said, luckily I have you, but I cannot be pregnant anymore. And, uh, and she had six, uh, I don't know if you say miscarriage or abortion, but like this. And the doctor, the, the her doctor said, listen, if you're going to be pregnant, you won't be alive. And you have a little girl and a husband, you have to be alive for them. So they decided not to have any more children. And then when Adassa started school here in Israel, and they studied the Bible, and the teacher is talking about Avram and Sarah, and she says, you know, Sarah had a problem, she had children. So Adassa says, boy, all of a sudden, Bible started interesting me. <laughs> what did they do? So Abraham had a child with a girl. The maid, she runs home. <laughs> Mom and dad and Adassa are having lunch, eating soup. And Adassa says, listen, Mom, dad, there is a solution. <laughs> solution for what? <laughs> also, Avram and Sarah couldn't have children. Who is Avram and Sarah? We don't have any neighbors by this name. <laughs> no, in the Bible. Dad, please, make me a sister with the cleaning lady. <laughs> so Adassa said, Mom was eating soup, and the spoon like this go. <laughs> she was shocked. On that night, my mom became pregnant. <laughs> I guess from fear. <laughs> and then she was very sick for nine months and the doctor knew that she wanted the baby so much. He said, don't tell anyone else, not the car... car, car yeah, the heart doctor, because they won't allow you. And then she gave birth, and Adassa and dad took care of her, and then she gave birth to me and she lost conscience and she was unconscious for a long time. The doctors didn't give her hope at all. But the doctor who took care of her said, I know Rebecca. She's a very strong woman. You'll see that she will be alive for a year. And someone else said, you'll see that she will be alive for 10 years. And when I was 10, we went to him with a big basket with wine and chocolates to thank him that she's alive. She lived till about 15 years ago. So I was the man. <laughs> and you know, I'll tell you why she was also so sick. She was a cosmetician. And uh, she was a nurse. 
One day she's walking in the camp and she's limping and a Nazi comes to her, takes out the gun, wants to shoot her. She knew nine languages. She said, wait a minute, you want to kill me because I'm limping, right? But I'm limping because I have warts on my toes. You gave us wooden shoes. <clears throat> they gave them that shoes, you know? They were walking those shoes. And she says, I'm not sick. And she says to him, you know, I'm a cosmetician and I know how to make pedicure. If you bring me a special knife, you'll see that I will fix my warts. The miracle was that he, he believed. <laughs> and he brought her the knife, she fixed the warts, she fixed for her friends, the husbands, other people. This way she saved many, many people. Now the Nazi saw that she's doing it so well, he said, do it to me too. <laughs> so she did to him, she did to his wife, she did manicure. Other Nazis came, her name like spread, till the commandant of the camp Amon get heard about her and told her, told, commanded her to come to him at night after she worked hard labor all day to give him manicure. <laughs> and she didn't want to go, she was afraid. He sent some Nazis who dragged her. She said, sometimes I came to him, his hands were full of blood after he killed some Jews and I had to clean it and do a manicure to him. In the movie, if you see it again, or if you remember, you see a woman giving him manicure. And then, because she knew German, one day he put the, he put a gun under her elbow. She asked him, why do you put the gun here? It's so difficult for me to work. He says, if you just scratch me, I'm going to shoot you on the spot. And then she went to the head of the Jewish police and said to him, you know, give me poison. I'm touching him. I put something under his nail and I'll kill him. <laughs> and he said, if you kill him, they'll kill all the 24,000 people. Don't do it. But she heard what he is talking to his other Nazis, how they are planning to kill and to burn and to hang. Mm -hmm. So when she went back to her barrack, she told the women, listen, tomorrow he's going to do this and that. And they warned the, warned the people, and that's how she saved also many people. One day she heard that they are going to kill 12 people who came from a city called Bochnia. She went back to the barrack. She told her friends, and they warned them. And they hid, and he didn't kill them. Now he started thinking, who is telling all the time all the things we are planning? And he understood <laughs> that's Rebecca. So he punished her in such a way. Now how do we know? She all day always told us, it's from the war, it's from the Holocaust. But she didn't say why she was so sick. Now we know, after we read her diaries that we want to publish, they whipped her all night long. She says all her back, everything was bleeding, torn, all the back, everything. And then they put her in a, a hole in the ground that was full with frozen mud. And she had to stand there for five days. They told her to stand with open legs. And she said, I was sure I'll never, I won't be alive. She stayed alive, but very sick. She had arthritis and heart problem, problems. And it's all because how she saved people. Do you think after that she stopped saving? She continued even in Auschwitz. I don't know how much time we have. Can I tell it? Yeah? When they brought her to Auschwitz, you heard about Mengele, the doctor who was doing the selection? So she said we came standing in a selection, <coughs> naked, in the winter, walking in front of him in the snow. He's just looking at them, not talking, and just points left or right. Now he sees her, he goes like this. She goes left, she sees she's among old people, sick. She understood it's death. So she ran out and came to the line again. Again, he looks at her. Again, she runs out. Like she all the time wanted to leave. She didn't want to die. And he, third time, he recognizes her. He says, what are you doing here? I sent you left. 
So she said, why do you want me to die? I'm young. I can work. So the Nazis beside him wanted to shoot her out there. She yelled at Mengele. He says, wait a minute. I want to hear what she has to say. She says, why do you want? I'm healthy. He says, no, you are sick. You have a big uh, pimple on your breast. <coughs> and she said, no, I'm not sick. She said to him, I got my period. You are lying. No one here is. I gave all the women special pills that they won't have. I didn't get. You are lying. We will check you. But if you are lying, you will be very sorry. And he called the Polish woman, told her, check her. And our mom, she took a piece of rag, and our mom said, one drop of blood saved me. And he left her alive. The next selection, again, I don't know, a week or two weeks after, they stand naked. They walk in front of him. All the Nazis are wearing coats and they are naked. And the Nazis are hitting them with the guns like this. And there was a little girl and he hit her so badly that she was bleeding all her thigh. And her mother saw that her daughter is bleeding. She started yelling. Ratunku, ratunku, like help in Polish. But everyone started walking away. No one wanted to touch the girl. If there will be blood on him, Mengele will send him to die. Now, our mom had this thing in her always to help, to save. So she ran to the Polish woman who checked her the previous time. She said, give me a piece of rag. She took it. She dipped it in the snow, wiped all the blood, tied her thigh so she'll stop bleeding. She told her mom, you know, she is little. Let's walk together. She will be between us. Mengele is sitting behind the desk. Maybe he won't see her bleeding leg. And really, she passed like that. <laughs> now our mom forgot about it and she never told us. And in 1974, I remember it like today, Mom and Dad came back from a, every year they used to go to a reunion of all the people who were in the camp or in the ghetto. And she comes back very, very excited. And we said, Mom, what happened? She said, you know, I'm sitting with Dad. And a woman about 40, I think, comes to me and says to me, Mom, Mom. And ma our mom says, I'm looking at her, I don't know who she is. And I think dad will think I had a child outside the wedding or something. <laughs> and she says, listen, I don't know you, and I'm not your mom. I said, no, you are not my biological mom, but you are more than a mom. You saved me in Auschwitz, I'm the little girl, and I've been looking for you for years. And it was so, we was, and, and she was, a religious woman, and she said, every morning I wake up, first thing I pray, and I say, Rebecca, I hope she is alive, and I pray for your health, and I'm so happy you are alive. When our parents immigrated to Israel, our father didn't know any Hebrew, and they didn't have time to study, they didn't have money and uh, he goes to a store to buy bread and he noticed that bread in Hebrew you say anyone knows how it's a bread lechem and fighting in the past tense you say lacham the same letters exactly you know in Hebrew you have the vowels like underneath the letters not like a and he says I know how much I had to fight for my bread checked in other languages and we didn't, he didn't find a connection between bread and fighting. He said, wait a minute, Hebrew is very special. And start and wrote a book, made a research about the Hebrew lang language, is like a linguistic, and he also painted many of the things. And I'll show you some. You see a woman, she has a chain with uh, bullets around her neck. 
And in her hand, she's holding a lipstick in the shape of a bullet. Now in Hebrew, weapons, you say neshek. And a kiss, you say neshika, the same letter. So he said, I wish that all the weapons in the world will turn into a kiss. Neshek, neshika. He was a fighter for peace and love. And look at this painting here. A symbol of love and peace. He said, if the hand is like this, it's a war. It's fighting, violence. But when it's open, it's peace. But for peace, you need a heart, right? So he painted the heart and the dove. This is a symbol of our parents. Our father always said, I'm half and mommy's half. Only when we are together, we are all. When a couple loves each other, with the time, their heads turn into one heart. <laughs> Our parents were very happy. They were always happy. We lived in a tiny, tiny house, and they were very happy. And look, this is a modern snail. <laughs> he has a house, a little house, but he's very happy. And this is like our father. <laughs> <laughs> a musician that playing on contrabass <coughs> with a saw. <laughs> now, mm. a tradition in Hebrew you say masoret, <laughs> and a saw you say maso, the same. Our father said he calls this painting in Hebrew mangina masorti mm. or traditional music. He <laughs> says, all the years, the world is trying to cut our tradition, but we are continuing. <laughs> uh, now we want to tell you, and you are, of course, ah, right. Here, our father always said, why are the wars in the world? Why people hate each other? People should just love. When there will be love, there will be no wars. And this is actually the symbol of how it should be. Look, from, they say, he said everyone should kiss and be happy. Now look, if you turn this painting from all, all the directions, it's the same. In the concentration camp, our father also painted many paintings. Some are in this book, Dear God, Have You Ever Gone Hungry? And this, he painted himself crossed on the swastika. <coughs> he said, if the Nazis kill me, and someone finds those pictures, so that they know who did it to us. And he always said, six million Jews were murdered, I think that now six million Christians should become Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> now we have a, <laughs> we have in Israel a, a museum in Tel Aviv. If someone is coming to Tel Aviv, they will give you also the brochure. You are welcome to come and. Uh, our father was the first animator in Israel, one of the first graphic artists, a painter, an author, a poet, a publisher, a photographer, many, many things. And uh, his studio, he built all the equipment, he built all the uh, small movie theater, 
uh, all the equipment for the animation. And uh, we have a big problem with the place. It used to be our father's and uh, something happened and a new owner came and kicked him out. It's a very sad story. And when our uh, mom was uh, very sick and, uh, and passed away, so he took an opportunity then. Very sad. He didn't know who my, our parents were. He just kicked our father out. And we, we are renting this place, uh, free rent now cost us a fortune. This month, he, I didn't tell you, he raised it in 2,000 shekels for a month. And, uh, and he wants us to get out of the place in one year. And we are devastated. We don't know what to do. We, we think, and many people think, that this museum should stay forever. Because people who come, they get so much, they see how a person who went through such, such hard time, never lost his hope and love, and made everyone laugh. And uh, we pray that uh, some miracle will happen, that we will be able all to build a new place, or we don't know what. So pray for us. Yes. Thank you so much. Amen. Ah, thank you. And, and our father told me, then when he painted this painting, I want, when I was five years, my father taught me to write words and music. And when Tlila was four years, so he taught her to tell jokes. Ah, do you want to hear a joke? Yeah. yeah. This one. <laughs> This woman, young woman, goes to a matchmaker. You know, today maybe you don't know what a matchmaker is because you have Jesus, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he went to the, she went to this matchmaker and says, listen, I have a terrible problem. My body secretes the smell of onion and no man is coming close to me. And I want to get married, but I can't. The matchmaker is so happy, he's jumping, kissing her. said, what happened to you? have such a problem, you are so happy? He says, you won't believe. Last week, a young, a young, nice man came to me, and he doesn't have the sense of smell. <laughs> <laughs> and you are from heaven. <laughs> and really introduces them, and they get married. <laughs> a few months later, he meets the young room and says to him, so tell me, how is the young uh, wife that I introduced to you? He says, I'll tell you, she is fantastic, but we are getting a divorce. Oh. A divorce? Why? I also don't know why. Every time I get close to her, I start crying. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one man comes to the priest or to the pastor and says, listen, I caught my wife with a man in bed. What should I do? Divorce her. But how can I divorce her? We have five children. Don't divorce her. But listen, I caught her in bed with a man. Divorce her. <laughs> but the kids don't divorce her. <laughs> but you know, my little Boy, he saw it too. Divorce. <laughs> <laughs> but how are the kids? It's there. Don't do it. <laughs> and like this, it goes on and on. In the end, the priest says to him, do you know what? Do me a favor. Go and become Jewish. <laughs> Jewish? Why? Turn, uh, um, um, drive the rabbi crazy, not <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so my father told me to write music to the old chapter uh, Yeshayahu, Isaiah chapter 2. I said, why? 
this is the most important chapter in the Bible. All world will come to Israel and will be peace. And then I didn't understand, I thought peace. Only now I understand what my father said. The all the world will come to Israel and we will sing it to you. In Hebrew. I wrote the music. והיה באחרית אחרית הימים, נכון יהיה, הר בית אדוני בראש ההרים, ונישא מגבעות ונערו אליו כל הגויים. והיה באחרית אחרית הימים, נכון יהיה, הר בית אדוני בראש ההרים, ונישא מגבעות ונערו אליו כל הגויים. הלכו עמים רבים, הלכו עמים רבים, הלכו עמים רבים ואמרו, לכו ונעלה אל הר אדוני, אל בית אלוהי יעקב, וירונו בדרכיו ונלכה באורחותיו, כי מציון תצא תורה, כי מציון תצא תורה. לא יישא גוי אל גוי חרב, לא ילמדו, לא ילמדו, לא ילמדו עוד מלחמה, כי מציון ציון תצא תורה, ודבר אדוני מירושלים, כי מציון ציון תצא תורה. only by us. They are not in bookstores because the publishing house in New York, they went bankrupt, so we take, good, take them. And also the paintings, lithographs, everything. We have also a disc with the songs from the Bible, but uh, we forgot to do it. <laughs> 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 of Isaiah that the day will come when nations will turn their swords into plowshare. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There's so little. If you see the Palestinians, all these people, all these complaining, all these saying how bad the Jews is. Here they have talked more about the positive things than all the hurt. Mm -hmm. you know, um, hatred they could have spout against the Germans. And you can help them, I feel to say to you, if you want to buy a book or something, and you want to make it your, your way to, <coughs> to help them to stay in their museum, then just give anything for the book that you feel on your heart, and everything will go to them. So you can take a book or... Do they take this to lithograph? Yeah, they, they pack it, and so uh, don't ask them how much is it. Just say, Lord, I will take a book or I'll take a little, and I'm going to pray for this too. They are wonderful. Yeah. And um, 
And, and if you help them, you know, they will have enough money to ask me again to pass over. So it's <laughs> We had a wonderful Passover with them. They were so nice. You um, Tom, just pray for them and we'll close this time. So